Hey guys, welcome back. I am Chris. And I am Randy. And you guys are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another unboxing video. Got quite a few things to open here for you guys. So if that sounds interesting to you, stick around. That's coming up right now. All right, guys, the first one comes to us from a viewer in Texas. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. Uh, actually, we got this in, I think, about a week ago. I want to use it in a weekly use gun review video. Uh, so I'm kind of holding on to it for that. But I kind of wanted to give you guys a sneak peek because this is really cool. And he also indicated that he wanted to see it in the video. So I'm going to try and get it in both. But it's definitely video worthy. This is a PPS 43C. Uh, this is actually built on a Polish parts kit. Now, the original story from this, they would have uh, started in Russia. Now, Russia going into World War II was using the PPSH-41, which did have a lot of stamped parts, but it did still take more time to manufacture because it had a wooden stock. Um, and they actually had it with a drum magazine as well. So there are actually entire units that were issued with submachine guns. They were very good for close in fightings in places like Stalingrad. Uh, so the Russian military wanted to get more submachine guns in the hands of the troops, uh, the Russian troops fighting in the Second World War. So around the time of 1943, they further simplified the design into a very stamped, uh, you know, metal folding stock submachine gun and they were able to produce these in larger numbers. Um, extra parts, magazines, stuff like that. Now, Poland, of course, uh, would use a lot of Russian firearms. They would do this with the TT-33 as well. Uh, so that's what this is. A Pioneer Arms would take those parts kits and build them into pistols. And so this is a semi-automatic pistol configuration. The folding stock is tack welded in place and the little push button to deploy it is basically just a static pin, if you will. So it is a pistol without a stock. Now with this, what he had was a complete parts kit. And in the parts kit, if I can dig through here and find it, it's basically, now you can get these parts kits, they're not very expensive. There it is. Um, this is an actual functioning stock for it with the rear receiver piece, which of course it has to be cut into many pieces to be imported. So what people will do is get the pistols and then get a parts kit. You can actually salvage parts from this, like the latching system, and put it in there if you want to SBR it. You send in your Form 1, and once it's been approved and sent back, you can use these parts in here as donor parts, if you will, to reactivate the stock on this one and then have a SBR. So that's what the previous owner intended to do, but didn't get around to doing. It does require a little bit of know-how to be able to do that. You have to drill this hole larger and stuff like that. Um, but still cool for what it is, even if you just leave it in pistol configuration. So I'm going to do more detail on that in a, in a weekly use gun review, hopefully coming up soon. But I wanted to start off the video with this. Next up, we have one from a customer in Tennessee. <laughs> Too close for machetes, switching the hands. Switching the hands. <laughs> So what we have here is a Smith & Wesson 380 bodyguard that does have the laser. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that or not or if that's really a good idea. Um, but it is the uh, 380 with a laser, very popular uh, for deep concealment or uh, possibly inside the lady's purse, does have a manual thumb safety. Um, a good option if you want to go really micro on concealed carry. Yeah, the bodyguard was sort of that generation of about 20, around that time, about 2009 to like 2011. A lot of companies were coming out with the small frame polymer 380s. The competitors to this are things like the Ruger LCP, uh, the Taurus TCP pistols, uh, and then, of course, the later generations of those. So this has always been a popular one to a lot of people. Uh, it does have a thumb safety, which is a feature that is a little bit unique for these little pocket pistols. So a lot of their contemporaries, their competitors do not use a thumb safety. And when a lot of people look at them in the store, this is one of the things they typically will turn them off to the firearm. Usually a deep concealment pocket gun usually will have a very heavy double action trigger and you put it in like a pocket holster and keep the tr trigger covered and you're typically good to go. The laser to a lot of people is kind of gimmicky. Um, 
but there's a practical use. I mean, the good thing about this is it really doesn't add a whole lot of weight or kind of bulkiness to the firearm, but it is something you're gonna have to kind of remember to turn on and use if you're in a stressful situation. And remember things like lasers and lights do point both ways. Anyway, these, uh, these are really cool pistols, I mean, for the money, especially you. So always happy to get these guys in. So thank you to our customer. All right, next up we have one from a customer in Pennsylvania. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. Big thank you to our uh, viewer, Jim, for sending along this awesome. Now that is a knife. That's a knife. <laughs> Good impression, Randy. Let me stand back. <laughs> People get upset when we use knives for cutting things, which is kind of what which they're used for. what they're made for. <laughs> I don't and, and it does beat a bayonet. It does. Also, I... I understand you should only use a bayonet to stab people, never to open a box. So we, we will not be using bayonets. Now we will be using knives, samurai swords, and machetes. Okay, yeah, we've, <laughs> we've exhausted that option. <laughs> kind of experimenting on what is, the, what is the perfect item for opening a box. I um, do not know, Chris, we should. Definitely not a box cutter, because those are dangerous. Those are, very, those are too dangerous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We have another Smith & Wesson product. Very nice. That is an M&P. Those are different serrations. Mm -hmm. uh, M&P 10 millimeter 2.0. Nice trigger. Um, Tall profile sights, but not a threaded barrel. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, of course, you have the second gen 2.0. Um, oh, oh, you know, it'll co wet this with the optic, duh. Okay, gotcha. so optics plate, optics ready, manual thumb safety, has the uh, more aggressive 2.0 stippling on the grip with the forward serrations, but the serrations on this are a little bit different looking from what I have ever seen. And then there's a trigger, which pretty, I don't know if that's an apex or not. Probably said what it was and the on the offer request, but beautiful handgun. Um, not much else to say about it. Of course, the second gens came out, the 2.0s came out a few years ago. I don't like the overly aggressive, aggressive stippling on the grip, but that's just me. Some people really do. You have two magazines, 15 round capacity, interchangeable back straps and optics plates. What do you think about the condition of that one? I would say it's actually in excellent condition, Chris. So that's what the customer said, and I agree with that. So we'll go ahead and let the customer know it's here. Thank you so much. Next up, we have one from a customer in Florida. This is a replica of a movie prop from The Last Samurai. Don't try this at home. <laughs> we are not trained professionals. No. <laughs> Humor, Chris. <laughs> We're not allowed to be funny on this channel. Aha! Ah! Wait, <laughs> you made short work of that box. <laughs> Florida. All right. Okay, so a couple Smith and Wessons from Florida. This is, I can tell right away, a 686. And this is a plus model, seven round capacity with, it looks like a two and a half or three inch barrel. Three inch? Three, yep. Three inch barrel. Um, from those of you guys who watch the channel often, you will know that the 686 is probably, it is my favorite 357 Magnum revolver. I have several 686s. Um, they're just a workhorse. They work, they're rugged, they're reliable. If you like blued revolvers, you want the 586. It is the same revolver. Uh, being the plus model, you do get seven rounds in the cylinder versus the traditional six, and then they do have the deluxe and the tallow models and things like that. So for the money, uh, especially if you can find a good condition when used, they are excellent, excellent 357s. I highly recommend taking a look at it. Uh, what do you think about the condition on that one? Really good. I would say very good, Chris. Very good. Uh, what do the customers say? There's a small blemish or two, so... You actually um, said good. Yeah, I would honestly say very good, very even good. excellent would be fine. So, um, very nice. That's, yeah, great revolver. So thank you for sending that one. Um, next. Next is a Smith & Wesson 686-6 Pro Series. Yeah. yeah, so speaking of the 
Pro Series or Performance Center, this one. So we had noticed that um, he had even pointed out to me that the front sight was bent just a little. We'll be able to realign that, that's no problem. Um, but this is a standard six round capacity. Uh, this looks like it's probably a four inch barrel, a little bit, uh, you can see more contours on the barrel end especially, but very nice target rear adjustable sights like on the standard model. Looks like a trigger profile is the same, but the hammer profile is a little wider, it looks like, but very nice revolver. Target crown barrel. Yeah, target crown barrel, yeah, didn't notice that, that's true. Yeah, so very nice, and what do you think about the condition on that one? I would say very good, Chris. Yeah, I would say very good, other than the front sight, which is slightly bent, so we'll be able to get that fixed. Uh, we'll just either replace it, which I don't even think it'll need to be, it's just like it's bent out of line, just barely. So we'll probably tab it back. If we can't, we'll just replace it. It's not a big deal. There's a little pin in the front and you can remove actually a roll pin here mm -hmm. and we can swap that out. So not, not a big deal. But um, yeah, I would say very good. Uh, good with the site, but once the site's fixed, that's a very good condition. And so, the customer said good. Yeah, so, so we're right there on the line. Yep. And those are the, uh, the factory wood grips that would have come with it too. Uh, next up, we have one that comes to us from a customer in Tennessee. Now this very special knife, a customer, a very good customer, Dave, let us borrow. We're going to be very careful with it, Dave, and send it back to you as soon as we're done. So thanks for letting us use it. Actually, all of these, kind of the funny thing is local customers have brought this stuff in for us to use in the videos, which is just kind of funny. So that's why we're using them. Um, no, we haven't gone insane yet. Have you all know there is a compass in the bottom? I believe that is a family heirloom. It is Dave's. very valuable. Soldier of Fortune magazine, had a promotion. This is more like Soldier of Misfortune. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody loves a SIG. This is a SIG P320. Everybody's familiar with these. This has like an OD green frame, which is pretty cool. This is the full size, uh, nine millimeter with night sights. It does have the trigger recall. If you look at a P320 and the trigger is a little bit wider, it was pre-recall, these had drop safety issues. In fact, people would hit them on the back with a mallet and were able to fire them. The military adopted this handgun as the M17. Of course, it looks a little bit different, but it's the P320 at heart. It has a trigger module inside that is a serialized part that you can pull out and put in different frames, different slide configurations, completely modular design. Released from SIG, it was a follow-on to the P250, which was a hammer fire pistol. The P320 is striker fired, but they used the same magazines. Um, so, very nice handgun. Uh, not much else to say about it. What do you think about that one, Randy? This has a few handling marks on it, Chris, um, but I would say very good. And customer says good, so. I'm yeah, good with it. Yeah, we're good with that. Um, I'd say very good condition as well, so. We will let the customer know what's here and move on to the next one. Next up is one from a customer in Pennsylvania. It's cool. Ooh, it's a snake. <laughs> it's literally a snake. snake. Okay, we have here is a Colt Anaconda, uh, eight inch barrel beautiful gun. This is actually new manufacturer, Cold Anaconda. So we've had a couple of Anacondas, uh, 1994 and 1995. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know the year of this one, but this is current production. They just just released, just, yeah. just released the Anaconda again, apparently. So on one of our last unboxing videos, I brought out a, pulled out a Anaconda from 1995. I had said that I knew Colt was remaking the snake gun line, but did not know if they had yet come out with the Anaconda. A lot of you were quick to remind me that they did in fact, and then we ended up getting one. So that all worked out nicely. I do still have the 1990s Anaconda. I want to do a comparison between the two. So I'm gonna hold on to those for a minute and actually do a video kind of highlighting the exact differences between the 1990s and the new one. There are a couple changes, but so far looking at it, this is not bad. No, and it feels very nice. Very the action's nice. very smooth. Yeah, so I, uh, I owned uh, two of the Anacondas, a six inch and an eight inch of the 1990s iterations. And picking this up for the first time, I'm very impressed. It's actually pretty um, beautiful. With the look and feel. Yes, yeah, very nice. nice. I'm actually more impressed with this than I was when I first picked up the new Python. 
Um, this looks great, but the Anaconda was a 1990s mainly firearm anyway, when a lot of the manufacturing techniques of Colt have moved away from a lot of the hand-fitting stuff anyway, so there's a lot of similarities here, but I'll address those. But anyway, very, very nice firearm. What do you think about the condition of that one? I would say excellent, Chris. I, is, I would too. I great. think that's what the customer said. I didn't get the paperwork in here. Uh, this is just FFL and driver's license, so I'm pretty sure I remember the customer saying excellent, but that's definitely like excellent condition, looks unused. So very, very nice. We will let the customer know what's here. This is a firearm from Tennessee. Thank you so much for sending it to us. All right, what we have here is a Mini 14. It's actually a small factory. It's a little five round, five round magazine. Um, Mini 14, essentially you have a cast receiver, scale, <laughs> scale down Sorry. version of the M14 design. A lot of these, um, you see these used through like the 70s and 80s and you know, police forces and things like that. But mainly where these have had a home is on the U.S. commercial market. Lots of people love these things. Mini 14 is an excellent rifle. Uh, very well made, very well manufactured, very well regarded and respected. So uh, we've had several of these in unboxing videos on the channel, weekly use gun review videos. So um, not much else really to say about it, but a beautiful firearm. Looking at it, I, this is a more recent production. One of the quickest ways you can tell is a rubberized butt pad. Kind of the early 90s ones had a plastic butt pad on it. But overall, uh, this is it's also marked 5.56 NATO. A lot of the early ones were marked 223. This is a beautiful rifle. I would say overall in excellent. Yeah, don't really see any marks on it. Maybe, maybe, yeah, I would say excellent. There's really no, no marks or anything. It looks like new. And what do the customers say? Customer says very good, Chris. Yeah, so I mean, there's, uh, if you look really close, there's a tiny, little tiny little marks. marks on the stock, but kind of from two feet away, you, you can't really tell, which is kind of my litmus test. So, beautiful gun. Thank you so much for our customer for sending this one in, and we will move on to the next one. Limited, Indiana, Chris. All right. All right. Last but not least. Uh, this is a Rock River AR of some sort, I imagine. Yeah. Ooh. This is a LAR 15. Very nice. Very beefy. Rock River Arms LAR 15. Rock River. Was it Rock River was the one that was known for the left handed? Am I thinking of the right one? No, that was Stag. Stag. Now yeah, you're right. Um, what's Rock River known for? They're known for being in Illinois. And uh, for having really beefy handguards. <laughs> having very beefy handguards. Rock, uh, yeah, Rock River, home of the beefy handguard, Chris. Only the beefiest. Very heavy. <laughs> they were also known for that Springfield Rock River carve out thing in Illinois that a lot of people are upset about. So there's that too. But really yeah. nice AR 15. <laughs> there's that thing. <laughs> there's that thing. Nickel Boron Volk Carrier Group. Yeah, I'd say a step up from the entry level. This is the Operator Edition. Operator model LAR-15. So, anyway, not much else to say about it. It's an AR-15, very cool firearm, and a big thank you to our customer in Bloomington, Indiana, for sending this one to us. So that'll be the end of this video. All right, guys. Well, that is all we have for you today on this. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let us know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to our channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting new content. And again, a big thank you to our local customers who have a little bit of humor and thought it would be funny to see us open boxes with stuff. So anyway, guys, we will leave you off there. I am Chris. And I am Randy. And we will see you guys next time. Um, another good use for this is you could use it to play with your cat. Yes. Just make sure the gun is unloaded before you do that. Uh, yes. Ask me how I know that. How do you know that, Chris? <laughs> I said, don't ask. So, <laughs> oh, you had to get a new cat. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that cat we got the other mm. What could go wrong, Chris? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing, Chris. You're asking, you're asking the guy with the cat. <laughs> it's a big snake. <clears throat> Alabama black snake. That's right. <laughs> Name that movie reference. <laughs> Full metal jacket. Yeah. All right. Okay. I cannot believe you did not mention 18 in that whole entire spiel. No, oh, you're right. All right, guys, thank you so much for stopping by and to. <laughs>
it is time to die, Mr. Bond. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! <laughs> I didn't realize it's very the back. Sharp. I didn't realize the back was serrated. <laughs> the back is very sharp, Chris. Now I hear the clack clack <laughs> clacking away at the keyboards. Yep, yep. Thank you to the customer who sent us the box of band-aids. <laughs> yes. Um, I have used a few of those. We actually they are, they were like top notch. When you work in a gun shop, your hands get beat up pretty bad. Um, whether or not you open things with uh, bayonets or samurai swords yeah. or machetes. <laughs> Randy got his hand caught in a Glock 34 the other day. Yeah, and yeah, so. that hurt. <laughs> and I am Randy! Ha! And demonetized. <laughs>